life shall be. They will, the King of glory, shall reign eternally. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today as we sing some wonderful old hymns, as we pray to God and as we hear from his word. Let's begin by singing our first hymn. Let's talk to God with a prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbours and to live for your honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now the words of assurance. For Christ died for your sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. That's from 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's say now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to hear our Bible passage for today. The reading for today comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 11 to 19. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, and since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, 
He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. We're now going to have God's word explained in our sermon. Welcome. It's great to be with you again. Growing up, my mum was a bit of a clean freak. My brother and I would often have to clean up our toys at the end of the day. In fact, I remember mum coming in and telling us, you better clean this up now or there'll be no dinner. (laughs) Today we find Jesus cleaning up the temple courts, God's house. There are many paintings depicting this scene. One is by the Italian master Luca Giordano, who portrayed Christ cleaning out the market areas. You can see a couple of Jewish leaders on the right side, the religious mafia discussing how they need to kill Jesus. Some people look at this scene and ask, did Jesus lose his temper and get angry? Isn't it a sin to be angry? This wasn't a spur of the moment action. The evening before, Jesus had witnessed the scene in the temple courts and he came back the next morning to do something about it. Jesus didn't blow his stack. In fact, he was filled with a settled righteous indignation at the way these people were cheating those who came to worship. He decided God's house needed a good cleaning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Keeping God's house clean. And of course, I'm not talking about this building. Let's learn three things the Bible teaches about God's house. Firstly, before the cross, God had a temple for his people. God directed Moses to build a tabernacle in the wilderness so he could meet the people in the process of worship. The tabernacle was a movable tent. It wasn't very large, about the size of a double wide mobile home. About 300 years later, David wanted to build a permanent temple in Jerusalem to replace that portable tabernacle. David wasn't allowed to build the temple because He was a man of war. So he helped raise the funds so that his son Solomon could build a house for God. It was a magnificent building that took 20 years to build. It contained so much silver and gold that in today's dollars, it would be worth, wait for it, over $200 trillion. That's a two with 11 zeros. On the day the temple was dedicated, Solomon prayed, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. God didn't really need a building because you can't restrict God to any dwelling. 
But he chose to allow his Shekinah glory to fill the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. But the Jews were rebellious and they forgot God. So the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC. When the Jews returned from captivity about 70 years later, a second temple was built. But this was a plain, basic building, not nearly as opulent as Solomon's temple. Then about 40 years before Jesus showed up in Bethlehem, Herod the Great renovated this second temple until it was a grand facility again. This is the temple that was in Jerusalem when Jesus walked through and started cleaning house. That temple was completely destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Will there be a third temple? Secondly, now God has a people for his temple. After Jesus died on the cross, there was no need for a temple. The moment he died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom signifying humanity no longer had to go through a ritualistic sacrifice to approach God. A new way to God was opened on the cross. God still has a temple, but it's no longer a building. He has a people for his temple. God's current house can be understood in two different ways. God dwells in the midst of his church. You see, when Paul wrote to the congregation at Corinth, he asked, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? When we gather together in the name of Jesus, he is here in our midst. This congregation, not this building is God's temple, but in addition to this collective expression of God's temple, there's also an individual application, that God makes his home in those who love and obey him. Again, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It is true, Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. 30 years ago, Robert Munger wrote a little booklet entitled, My Heart Christ's home. It's a wonderful little book that has sold over 10 million copies. Now, when you place your faith in Jesus, he inhabits your body, your soul and your spirit. He owns us. And sometimes you might hear a Christian say, well, it's my life, my body. I can do with it as I please. Well, that's not quite so. The Bible says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. So since collectively we are God's temple and individually we are God's temple, how then can we keep God's house clean? And that leads us to the final truth, that God wants his temple to be pure and holy. The Bible says, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Jesus walked into that temple that day And what he saw wasn't holy and pure. He had the right to clean out God's house because it was his father's house. So he took charge and did something about it. Have you allowed Jesus to take charge in your life? Let me share briefly three things that happen when Jesus takes control of his temple, your life, and starts cleaning house. Firstly, when Jesus is in charge, he drives out dishonesty. Again, the Bible says Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who are buying and selling there. Was Jesus upset because people were changing money and selling animals in the temple courts? No. 
He was upset because they were crooks. He called them a den of robbers. When you allow Jesus to rule in your life, he will drive out dishonesty and replace it with truth. For Christians, honesty isn't the best policy. It's the only policy. Is your life characterized by honesty, transparency and integrity? And secondly, when Jesus is in charge, he promotes prayer. Jesus said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus wants every church to be a house of prayer. Again, not the building, but the people. In the temple worship, there was music, sacrifices, teaching, offering and fellowship. But God never said his house would be a house of singing or a house of offering or a house of teaching. He said it was to be a house of prayer for all people. Not just the Jews, but for all people. And as an individual temple, Jesus wants to make you a house of prayer. I believe the best barometer to gauge your spiritual health is actually your prayer life. When people talk about you, do they ever say, oh, he's a real prayer warrior or she's a real prayer warrior? Is your life like a house of prayer? I found that Satan will try to tempt you with busyness and other good things, anything to keep you from praying. And thirdly, when Jesus is in charge, he continues to cleanse us. The Bible again says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love that verse because it doesn't say we are faithful. It says he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. When you trust Jesus, he comes to live in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to try to act holy. You are holy because Jesus lives in you. So the lesson we learn from this passage is that God won't live in a dirty house. You may live in one, but God won't. He's holy and he can't abide with the presence of sin. Over the years, I've moved into a number of houses. God also has been moving in and out of houses throughout history. We saw where God lived in the tabernacle and then the two temples. But the temple in Jerusalem was desecrated by sin. And God had already moved out when Jesus arrived. The Jews were worshipping there during the life of Jesus and even for 40 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. But God wasn't there. It was only empty religion. Jesus pointed at the temple and said to the Jews, look, your house, not my father's house, is left to you desolate. Why did God move out? Because God won't live in a dirty house. God had another temple I didn't mention. And this temple was Jesus himself. You see, when Jesus walked on this planet, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him. He even said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it back. But when Jesus became sin for us on the cross, God had to move out of that house for three hours. And that's why Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus lose the presence of his father, which had been his from the beginning of the beginning? Because God won't live in a dirty house. Now let's talk about God's current address. If you're a Christian, you are his temple. So what comes to your mind when I say, God won't live in a dirty house. Are you thinking, "Uh uh-oh, well, there's sin in my life, so does Jesus move out? Well, before I understood the power of grace, I might have preached something like, well, so you'd better make sure you clean up your act if you don't want God to forsake you. 
But if Jesus lives in you, grace means you're never a dirty house. You're a child of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you might occasionally have a dirty thought or say a dirty word, but you're not a dirty house. Being clean is a state of grace and certainly not based on your behaviour. God has declared you holy and righteous based on your faith in Jesus. God is no longer moving in and out of houses. He has come to take up permanent residence in believers. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be in you and he will be with you forever. When King David sinned, he had to beg God, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You don't ever have to pray that because he will never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that. So you may be thinking, well, are you saying to me that when I come to Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live in me? And even when I sin, God doesn't forsake me? Well, actually, that's right. And if you're thinking, well, that sounds too good to be true. Again, you're absolutely right. Grace always sounds too good to be true. So where does God live today? He lives in his church and he lives in me and you. And as we continually yield control of our lives to him, he will drive up dishonesty, make us a house of prayer, and he will keep on cleansing our hearts. May this be an encouragement to you today. Some remarkable hymns with powerful words and beautiful melodies have been written over the last 200 years. And this is certainly one of them. Please join me in singing our next hymn. Let's sing together now, The Lord's My Shepherd.
Let's spend some time now talking to God in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, our worries and concerns weigh heavily upon us. We give them to you. We ask that you provide all we need in these difficult times. Help us to keep trusting in you. Help us to continue rejoicing in what you have done, despite the hardships we face. Help us to focus on the eternal rather than the temporal. Please guard our hearts from temptation to sin at this time. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the people of the world and their leaders. We pray for the countries that are in crisis. Give wisdom to those in authority in every land. And give to all peoples a desire for righteousness and peace and the will to work together in trust, to seek the common good and to share with justice the resources of the earth. Father, hear our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together now a beautiful hymn. Thanks very much for your company today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. Let's conclude with the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will Shall be.